Okay, so we're going to now uh, move into this topic of arc length and curvature. We've already been looking at space curves, and so now we want to see how we can, for example, measure the length of a curve through, uh, through 3D space. So I want you to recall this formula. We, we look at parametric uh, curves in, on a plane back, you know, back in Calc 2. Um, this was the formula for the, the length of a planar curve. So you have like T going from A to B, right? Uh, and then, so what we're essentially doing, you want to remember is you kind of like, you have like this, this starting point and this ending point, A, uh, I'll just say T equals A and T equals B. And what you kind of do is we're, now I'm going to really, really uh, over-exaggerate this, but you kind of, you're chopping it up into a bunch of little pieces. What we're doing is we're taking the, um, seeing the change in, um, it's, you're, the, the, you're making a bunch of little right triangles where you have the dx and the dt, dy, uh, dx over dt, then dy over dt, like the change in x and the change in y. And what you're doing is like just measuring this hypotenuse. And so what you end up with is a whole bunch of these, um, little tiny segments and all together. Now, of course, this is infinitesimally small segments, so it actually follows a curve, but this is um, very grossly exaggerated. You can kind of think of this as, in terms of a limit, as the limit as these, I actually should have put delta x over delta t. But in any rate, that's the idea. So then the, uh, what you have is the, um, the arc length in 3D space for some vector function f of t, g of t, h of t, it's going to follow the exact same. It just extends to another dimension. So you're going to take in linear, th this integral from a to b, and it's the square root of dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared plus dz over dt squared, and then you have the dt hanging on the end. And you can actually simplify this a little bit using vector um, derivative notation. Uh, this is actually the same as the magnitude of the first derivative of t, dt. That's actually another way of writing this thing. So you take the derivative of the vector function r, and you calculate its magnitude and take an integral of that magnitude from a to b. OK, now as an example, let's take this. We're going to look at the arc length along this helix, uh, cosine t times i plus sine t times j plus t times k. So this, we're going to go from 1, 0, 0 to 1, 0, 2 pi. So in other words, t is going to be going from 0 to 2 pi. This is going to be one full rotation of this helix. Um, and so uh, we'll just evaluate this. We're going to, the length is going to be an integral from 0 to 2 pi, where you know t is the variable of integration here. And um, what we have is the square root of the first component, the derivative squared, so that's going to be negative sine of t squared, plus the derivative of the second component, that's going to be a cosine of t squared, plus the derivative of the third component, which is just a number one. And then I'll put this dt on the end. We'll clean this up a little bit, and you'll see it's not actually that bad, because this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. The square root of, well, what's this? This is sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. That's the Pythagorean identity. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, this is just going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of square root of 2 dt, which in the end is just square root of 2 times 2 pi, uh, which, how would you write this? I guess you could write this as 2 root 2 times pi. That's fine. That's how many units long. So this is you kind of start here and you're going around uh, the helix one one root and so this is not uh, this is not 2 pi long it's actually 2 times root 2 pi so that's kind of how how far this thing is stretched in a sense <laughs> all right so if the curve c is only traversed once uh, as long when a t goes from a to b so it doesn't like double back on itself then the arc length uh, function is can be a function of t, which is to say how what is the length between a and uh, and where we stop at time t. Uh, when t from t equals a up to t equals 
uh, some value t that we kind of pick. So it's going to be s of t, some function s of t, where s is going to be used often for the arc length. It's the integral from a to t of, uh, we're going to use a change of variable so we don't have t's, because t is now a variable of integration. Uh, it's, a, it's a bound. It's a variable bound uh, of magnitude of r prime of u du, which we can write, write also as uh, as this integral from a to t, uh, where we ha are taking the sum of these squared uh, partial derivatives. I should uh, taking the sum of these squared derivatives uh, times, and then the du at the end. So this is another way of writing this. Um, and so what we're going to, the reason we're interested in an in arc length is um, we can, so we may wish to parameterize the curve in terms of arc length rather than t. The reason being, you can you can actually um, define the same curve, the same exact curve in space, um, with different parameterization of t, um, where you, if you have, um, if you double the speed at which you traverse it, then you can, then uh, it's going to change the function. But if you have the parameterization in terms of the length that it's traversed thus far, it's going to be a unique parameterization of the curve. So the idea is we can then find the inverse uh, t of s, uh, and then we use this as the input into our vector function r of t. So um, this, so let's take a, a look at an example. OK, so let's take a look at this helix again. Uh, r of t is cosine t i plus sine t j plus t k. And so we wanted to reparameterize this in terms of arc length. Remember what we uh, what we do s of t is this integral from here. It's going to be from zero up to t of uh, this square root of. Remember what it was. It was when we did this in, in this derivative. Actually, it was it was two. Remember it was one plus one because we had sine squared plus cosine squared. So actually, it's just the square root of two, and then it was. Uh, a du. So this actually comes out to be simply um, uh, square root of 2t. Uh, so in other words, s equals square root of 2t. So t is going to be 1 over square root 2s. And so we can reparameterize this. r of s is going to be the cosine of s over root 2 i plus the sine of s over root 2 j plus s over root 2 k. So now we've reparameterized. And so uh, as we increase the arc length, this will tell you exactly where you get to at, a, at any given point. So we'll define a couple of terms now. A parameterization, parameterization of, a, of, a, of a space curve, r of t, we call it smooth on some interval as long as this first derivative is continuous. And we want to make sure that the, the, this first derivative is never anywhere equal to the zero vector anywhere on this, uh, on this, uh, on this interval. Meaning what that means is that basically the um, the, the curve is only going to make like nice uh, this, this this curve through space actually doesn't make doesn't come to any corners or points um, or, or or make any uh, sudden uh, sudden jumps in speed something like that so we, we say a curve is smooth if it has a, a smooth parameterization so if there's a way you can parameterize this curve in space such that it is a smooth parameterization, then this, the curve, we call it smooth. And then it looks like we've been describing. Um, no corners, no cusps, nothing pointy. <laughs> so if you have a smooth curve, then its unit tangent vector is given by the, we call it capital T, remember? And it's the, the first derivative divided by the magnitude of the first derivative. And so if we're interested in how does the, f the tangent vector change, if we look at the, um, how the unit tangent vector changes with respect to arc length, it would be independent of the parameterization that we're using. And then we call that curvature. OK, so we define the curvature of a curve, kappa, uh, which is actually kappa is a function of time, um, could be. 
or function, uh, but the kappa at, at any given point on the curve, right, um, is going to be the absolute value of the change in the, it's the derivative of the unit tangent vector uh, with respect to a change in curve, a change in arc length, dt over ds, all right? So remember, if we, if we find the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to t, we can, um, we can actually express that as the, the dt over ds times ds dt. And so in fact, uh, if we wanted to find uh, dt over, uh, over ds, we can express this as dt uh, dt divided by ds dt. And so we're going to re redefine the, the curvature in that way. It can be written as the, um, the magnitude or the absolute value of dt over dt, all of that over ds over dt. And because the um, ds over dt is actually just the, um, the, the change, uh, the, 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 the first derivative, that's a change in curvature with respect to change in, or <laughs> so because ds dt, we just define this as the magnitude of the, of r prime. Um, what we, what we can write is, uh, the curvature can be written as the magnitude of t prime, which is disrespect to, with respect to t over r prime magnitude of t prime of t over the magnitude of r prime of t. So this is another way that you can, you can calculate the curvature. Okay, now let's consider a circle of radius a. We'll parameterize this x equals a cosine t and y equals a sine of t. And we can actually calculate the curvature of this two-dimensional curve, no problem. So what I want to find is what is the uh, the first derivative, and that is going to be the first component is going to be the derivative of the cosine, which is negative a sine of t. And the second one is going to be a cosine t. This is the first derivative. If I, I'm going to need to find the magnitude of this, right? And what is it? Um, it's the square root of a squared sine squared t plus a squared cosine squared t, which is just a, the square root of a squared <laughs> times one, right? Which is just a. So um, the, the, to make this, the, the, the unit vector, uh, the unit tangent, I should say, the unit tangent vector is going to be one over a times negative a sine t and then a uh, cos t, right? To turn, this is to say, this is r prime of t divided by magnitude of r prime t, uh, which is of course just negative sine t cos t. And let's find its derivative, t prime. We've got negative cos t, and then we'll have negative sine t. We're going to find this derivative, this uh, magnitude. The magnitude of this is, of course, the square root of cosine squared t plus sine squared t, which is just a big old one. So what is the curvature? I said it's the magnitude of t prime of t over the magnitude of r prime of t. Well, this is uh, the magnitude of t prime is a one divided by the magnitude of r, r prime is an a. So the curvature of a circle of radius a is one over a. So in other words, you can, we're talking about 
as the what is the the change of like of the the <clears throat> how is the um uh we're kind of quantifying how fast does the uh does the does the how fast <laughs> does the tangent vector change with respect to a little bit of change in uh in in arc length and you can you can see as the circle gets bigger then the same small amount of change in arc length is going to have a smaller and smaller impact on the change in the unit vector or in the unit tangent vector so uh, the the curvature can be expressed in this other way this is a theorem that i'm not going to prove you can look up the proof but um the curvature at time t is given by the magnitude of the cross product of r prime t uh, cross r double prime t and then this uh and then that's divided by the magnitude of r prime cubed so we're going to cube that uh, we'll we'll look at an example. So we have this this twisted cubic uh, uh, space curve. I'm going to find the um, the first derivative, r prime of t, and that is pretty simple. It's one, two t, and then three t squared. I get the second derivative. That's going to be zero, two, and then six t. And so what I want to do is find the a couple things. I'm going to find the, the magnitude. I might as well do that right away. The magnitude of r prime t. I'm going to express it in terms of t. So this is going to be the square root of 1 plus 4 t squared uh, plus that would be 9 t to the fourth. I'm going to need that in the formula, and let's let's get a uh, let's find the cross product of these two. So the cross product um, r so r uh, prime cross r double prime is going to be i j k one two t three t squared zero two six t. Okay, and so this is going to be uh, we've got Let's see, we've got 12 t squared minus 6 t squared for the first component. For the next one, we've got 3 t squared times 0, that's a 0, uh, minus uh, 6 t. And then for the third component, we're going to have 2 minus 0. So that's just a, okay. So um, we've got 6 t squared minus 6 t and 2. What's its magnitude? the magnitude of r prime cross r double prime is square root of, let's see, that's gonna be 36 t squared, or sorry, that's t to the fourth, plus 36 t squared plus four. All right, uh, so altogether then, we have the, the curvature at any for for any at any t is given by the square root actually um yeah I'll I'll just I'll just leave it as in terms of two square roots we've got the square root of 36 uh t to the 4th plus 36 t squared plus 4 all over the square root of now this is going to be cubed but I'll still write it out it's, I'm going to write it in this order 9 t to the 4th plus 4t squared plus 1, and that's cubed. So this is the curvature at any point, or at any time t. So for example, the, the curvature at time uh, 0 is going to s simplify to be the square root of 4 over the square root of 1 cubed, which is just going to come out to be 2. Okay, so if, we're, if we are looking at a plane curve, like y equals f of x, uh, so where the, the curve that follows this function, we can let x be the parameter. And um, so we would actually, the, the r of t in this case, right, is going to be, um, it would be t and then uh, I guess we would say like f of t, kind of like that. Um, and, and so when we work everything out, we end up 
this is the simplification of this. Now, if, if I would put actually x in place, right? I'm gonna, I'm not gonna work it all out, but um, this is what, uh, this is what the result would be. So the curvature at for any x value is found by you take the absolute value here. No, these are absolute values, not magnitudes. Absolute value of f double prime uh, over the absolute value of one plus f prime squared to the three halves power. Uh, let's take a look at what this um, what would be for an example. Let's let y equals x squared. And let's, uh, let's find what the curvature is for any value of x. So um, the curvature at some value of x, it's going to be, I'll just write this out in the formula, the absolute value of the second derivative would be 2, right? Because y prime is 2x, and then y double prime is just 2. Um, that's what we have up in the numerator. And down below, we'll have 1 plus 2x squared to the 3 halves power. So let's let's rewrite that a little bit. Um, this actually is going to be 2 over, so this is, uh, since 1 plus 2x squared is always positive, we can write this as the square root of 1 plus 4x squared cubed. OK, so for example, the curvature at the point uh, at when x is 0 is going to be 2 over 1, so that's just 2. The curvature at 1 is uh, when that, that's to say at the point 1, 1 is going to be uh, 2 over, let's see, this is going to be square root of 1 plus 4 is 5 to the third, okay? And the curvature at 2, so this is at the point 2, 4, um, we're going to have 2 over square root of Let's see, it's 1 plus 4 times 4, that's 16, that's 17, root 17 cubed. So uh, what we have then is the curvature of this parabola, like you know this is a parabola. At this point, it has the highest curvature, the curvature is 2. And then at this point here, I'm, I'm being a little bit not careful. Curvature is a little bit less than 2, right? It's, it's lower in here at this point here. The curvature is even less. So the idea is the curvature is actually, um, it's decreasing. And, and in fact, you can, you, can, you can actually interpret the curvature as the, um, uh, if you were to, well, actually, let's talk about that in a little bit. So we'll talk about the they interpret curvature in terms of circles um, in, in just a bit. Uh, first, we have to define a couple other little things. So if we take a smooth space curve, R of t, we can get its unit tangent vector. And it turns out the unit tangent vector is orthogonal to its derivative, t prime. Um, if we turn, we turn t prime into a unit vector, we call it the normal vector. n of t is just, it's t the first derivative of t, so t prime, divided by the magnitude of t prime. OK, so that's going to be called the normal vector. So we'll define the binormal vector as the cross product of the unit tangent vector and the normal vector, which by definition is always a unit vector. So, if you, so one thing to point out, if you take two uh, unit vectors, um, what these two, the, the tangent vector, uh, tangent unit vector and the normal unit vector, these two vectors are, um, they're, they're actually orthogonal to each other. And so uh, what we get is by definition then, this uh, binormal vector is a, a unit vector. The cross product of two orthogonal unit vectors is a third unit vector, which is uh, orthogonal to the the two of them. Um, the so that what we what we kind of have I'm going to try to illustrate it a little bit. So you have this this curve going through space. So suppose we have the um, the the tangent the, the unit tangent vector might look like this, okay, and the um, the the normal vector would 
look like this, for example. And so the binormal vector would be, and I can't really draw it because it's like coming towards us. This would be where like the binormal vector would be, where it, it, it's making um, a right angle with both of them. Can you kind of picture that? Okay, so uh, what we what we can do is we can um, well we can use the the tangent vector. So the the normal vector is showing the direction in which the tangent vector is changing, uh, and the binormal vector is going to be normal to this plane that contains the curve at that point. Uh, we'll we'll. We'll show an application of this in just a second, but let's get a, do a little bit of practice finding the normal vector and the uh, and the, the 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 binormal vector. Okay, so let's take a look at this helix again. So as you recall, um, if if I, the first derivative is going to be the negative sine of t i plus the um, the cosine of t j plus k, and uh, if you recall, this uh, this thing had the magnitude of r prime of t was square root of two. We did this earlier on, and so the tangent unit vector, uh, the unit tangent vector, is going to be the you take the, um, the, the first derivative and divide it by its magnitude, and so it's going to be negative 1 over root 2 sine of t i plus 1 over root 2 cosine of t j plus uh, 1 over root 2 k. We're going to now find its derivative, so the t prime is, uh, well, we're going to get a negative 1 over root 2, uh, that's going to be a cosine of t i, right? And then we're going to have minus 1 over root 2 sine of t j. And then the last component is constant for t, and so its derivative is going to be 0. Um, the Because uh, this is because this is just has it's one over root two times this vector, which is like cosine and a sine. This magnitude is always going to be uh, one over root two. So magnitude of t prime uh, it comes out to be one over root two uh, always. All right, and so uh, if I scale it down, the normal vector, right? I'm going to write it like this, normal vector of t, it's, it's t prime of t over the magnitude of t prime of t. This is just to say, it's, 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 I'm going to divide this by 1 over root 2, which is the same as multiplying it by root 2. And so um, this is actually just going to be negative cosine t i minus sine t j. That is a unit vector. And what I want to do now is find the cross product of t uh, and n. The binormal vector is t. I'll, I'll I'll be a little bit more explicit with the little with the, with the parameters t cross n. Let's figure this out. So we have i, j, and we have k. We have the t vector is, we have negative 1 over root 2 sine of t, 1 over root 2 co cosine of t, and then we have 1 over root 2. Now for the, for the normal vector, we have negative cosine t, negative sine t, and we have a 0. Okay, so we're going to have i times so it's 1 over root 2 cos t times 0, which is 0, minus uh, negative 1 over root 2 sine t. That's negative 1 over root 2 sine of t, but that's negative negative, so that makes it a positive. Okay, now it's going to be minus the j vector times, 
what do we have? We have negative 1 over root 2 sine t times 0, which is 0, minus 1 over root 2 times negative cos t. So this is minus 1 over root 2 cosine t. But that's minus a minus, which makes it a plus, right? And so then the last one is going to be plus the k vector times, what do we have? We have negative 1 over root 2, negative, negative, which makes it a positive, uh, 1 over root 2 sine squared of t uh, minus, minus <laughs> 1 over root 2 cos t times negative cos t. So that's, that becomes uh, minus a minus, which is plus, okay, but it's one over root two cosine squared t. Well, um, not going to uh, simplify this anymore. It's enough to just to look at this and say, okay, well, that's the binormal vector uh, for, any, for any time t. So if you have this space curve going along, right? Um, at any point along it, point P, the, 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 the plane that is determined by that point and this normal vector is, uh, it, it is going to be called the normal plane. And if you can sort of uh, picture this, it's, it might be a little hard to, to see, but I'll, I'll try to draw it. Uh, where we have actually, like, this is going through it, and this 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 is meant to show it's like it's a it like a a plane that the curve is piercing through at a right angle uh, at any given time. That's the normal plane, and so the tangent, uh, the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector is going to be the normal vector for that plane. Like that would that would determine the equation for that plane. So the plane with normal vector. Uh, B uh, it, it at point P is going to be called the osculating plane. So what that what I'm trying to say is, uh, if you have this okay, so you have this curve, and at point P you've got the unit tangent vector, and you've got the normal vector. And as I said, you know T cross N is going to give you a third vector, which in this case you have to kind of imagine it uh, sort of. Um, you kind of have to imagine it kind of coming out at, of the page. And so it is. it makes the right angles with both of these. What's happening with this third plane, this is the binormal vector. So this, the plane that's normal to that, which contains both the, the normal vector and the tangent vector, those are both on the plane. This is a plane which contains, like at, at this moment uh, right here at point P, the curve is lives on that plane that's called an osculating plane of course it as the, as you the curve as you move around the curve that plane is going to tilt you know and shift and move and stuff but the idea is it's it's at that moment the curve is on is moving on that plane uh, that's called the osculating plane so given these ideas of this normal plane and this this osculating plane actually um if we Think of uh, at the on the curve C uh, at point P. If we look at a, if we try to define a circle that lives on this plane, and it has the same tangent as um, as the curve at P, <clears throat> and if it, the one that lies on the concave side of C, that's in the direction of N, has a radius of rho is one over kappa, one over the curvature. That's called the osculating circle. So let's let's show you what I mean. So I'm going to Okay, let's take. Let's suppose that I'm drawing this on the, the, at this moment we're like on the the osculating plane. So this is my point P, right? I'm going to draw these. the The tangent vector is right here. So this is my tangent vector, and my normal vector is is going to look like this. We have we've got a um, we've got uh, the the normal vector is um oh you know what i feel like i might be might not have enough room i'm going to i'm going to fudge things a little bit i'm going to move this down okay okay so um the 
idea is if you go out a distance of do 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 let's just say it's here where this distance is 1 over the curvature at this point and define a circle with that center uh, and and that radius right Ooh, I'm doing a pretty sloppy job but anyway this circle is going to be tangent to the curve at that point and this this circle is going to um, it's going to have it, so it has it, the curvature on the on the radius of the circle uh, the curvature of the circle is kappa uh, this curve circle just de kind of describes how like the the curvature like how the curve C is is behaving near point P and so you can actually uh, you can actually graph like this the osculating circle going along some curve uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate that okay so I'm trying to show here what we have is a curve that's going through space and um, at this point you have this osculating circle I'll, maybe I'll, I'll put it like here so you can see um, if you go out in the direction of the normal vector which is blue here um, you go out you can as as I move along the point that you can see the osculating circle changes in radius and as we move around it gets bigger when the curvature is lower right the tighter the smaller the lower the curvature the smaller the osculating circle and the plane that it is on is shifting as we move f along okay so it's like this it's like um, you can think of it kind of like a if you're going along in a roller coaster, um, you're the the top of the track is like uh, going in the direction of like the the normal curve. Uh, well, it's not always the case for a roller coaster. I mean, <laughs> but this could be the case. If you want to be feeling the the force of acceleration, uh, always um, you can uh, you could think of well, which side of the which side of do you want to be sitting on the side of the normal vector or the opposite one? Um, anyway, I guess I guess what I just wanted to illustrate is this uh, osculating circle and like what it looks like as you roll as we go along the point. But you can see that the the tangent vector is red and that is always pointing in the direction of the curve. The normal vector is yellow. Oh, the, sorry. The 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 blue vector is like how in the direction in which the 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 tangent vector is about to change is like changing right and then the yellow vector is the bi this binormal vector use that to define this osculating plane find the center of the osculating circle um, I don't want to spend too many much time on that it's just an application of this that is useful in certain engineering applications uh, alright well we're gonna wrap it up there uh, and uh, we'll do some of this stuff in class alright bye